And that discussion, dear ladies and gentlemen, does bring to an end this first session, first technical session of our forum. And we want to move on seamlessly to our last session for today. That's uh, our second session. And I know it's been a long and intensive day, so I'm very grateful to everybody for staying with us uh, and also in the online audience as well. But you don't want to miss this session. It's very short, but it's on the very important topic of deep decarbonization particularly as regards industries, uh, industries uh, needs for power. So let us move on with our session two entitled Raising the Bar. And we want to raise the bar because as we heard at the very outset of our opening session this morning, we must dramatically accelerate climate action if we're serious about achieving net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And that presents a very serious abatement challenge challenge, particularly for energy intensive industrial sectors such as manufacturing, transport, heating and cooling of buildings, all of them major contributors to world CO2 emissions at the moment and all of them heavily reliant on fossil fuels. So countries need to reconcile their economic aspirations for growth and industrial development with their climate goals. And to do so, many will see very strong arguments for boosting the share of nuclear power. For this session, we will first hear four pre-recorded presentations, and then we'll go into the Q&A panel. So as I said, it's a short, uh, but very important session. And please do share your questions with our speakers. Either get ready, those of you who are live in the room with us, or share them via the chat function on the IAEA app. Nuclear energy's potential industrial applications extend far beyond electricity generation. And we've heard a few mentions of other applications already today. Our first presentation will now explore the use of SMRs for district heat and resource extraction, as well as for cogeneration of hydrogen, something that, of course, Boris Schucht talked about in his presentation in the opening session. We are pleased that Def Dr. Jeffrey Griffin, who is the Vice President of Science and Technology for the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, joins us by video. Hello, my name is Jeff Griffin and I'm the Vice President for R&D at the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to make this presentation at this forum. I wish we could all meet in person, but clearly we've got to deal with the current world circumstances. To give you context for my presentation, I want to uh, note at the outset that CNL, uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, is the premier national nuclear laboratory in Canada. As such, our portfolio of work and interest spans across all areas nuclear, as illustrated on this slide. But as you can see, a very central and key element of our mission is uh, focused on clean energy. And I'm going to discuss some of our areas of interest and work in the next few slides. For Canada, clean growth and climate change are national priorities with ambitious and defined goals. Our approach is a holistic one that couples nuclear with renewable energy and uh, specific applications. These priorities and this approach yield opportunities for nuclear energy, including energy independence for off-grid communities that cur currently are primarily reliant on diesel, uh, clean energy sources for mining, uh, resource extraction and manufacturing, potential new approaches for powering transportation and industry and storing energy, such as the production of hydrogen, and the p potential for cogeneration of hybrid energy, uh, in hybrid energy systems to enable renewables to intermittently be incorporated. A central piece of our effort to pursue these opportunities is with SMRs, small modular reactors. As we go forward with SMRs, we all realize that we have to bring our stakeholders along with us. We must strive to build confidence in our neighbors and our communities that host these SMRs, the financial supporters, the political and regional stakeholders. And to do that, we, need, we must be able to articulate, explain, and demonstrate the technologies. The days of people trusting scientists just because we say so are long gone. Demonstration of technologies builds confidence in the technology, provides more assurance to the key stakeholders and reduces uncertainties and risks that affect the cost of financing, 
affect the timing of construction and the time for commissioning. So demonstration is necessary, a key component of any of our planning. So as we start to look at more closely at potential applications of nuclear energy in this way beyond power generation, we consider SMRs as the next generation of nuclear technology offering unique flexibility so that our traditional ways of considering nuclear power for only for electrical generation becomes only part of the equation. We can now consider that we can couple nuclear power to other uh, systems and other energy sources uh, for intermittent energy uh, supply and able to store energy for later use. We can use nuclear power for hydrogen generation for transportation. We can use nuclear power to provide heat for communities and energy or heat for resource extraction and for industry. Including in this are new processes uh, and more efficient processes for hydrogen production, something that CNL is actively working on right now. If we extend this concept and illustrate it, we might envision something like what you see on this slide. Nuclear power at the center, but coupled to other energy sources and continually balancing the integration, which will require smart grid and predictive modeling of all energy sources with the diverse and variable needs of a community that might change over days, months, years, uh, or seasons, but you can adapt to that with this sort of system. Challenges exist, of course. There are technical challenges, but there's a lot of great work that's being done worldwide on this. And then there are policy and financial challenges at several levels of government. How do we get the licensing right? How do we get the market set up to effectively regulate such grids? How do we incentivize sustainability? How do we incentivize investment in necessary capital assets? How do we manage ongoing operation and maintenance? Canada and CNL are pursuing this with an SMR at the heart of it. An idea is to help place the SMR and demo the SMR and use it in conjunction with hydrogen and renewable energy sources to work with different applications and to demonstrate such issues as licensing. The idea is to demonstrate this so that we can work with communities and other stakeholders to see what works, to get them comfortable with the approach, build confidence, and demonstrate the full value proposition. Approaches like this are very, very important because we believe they are essential for ultimate success in this. In summary, the SMR value proposition extends far beyond electrical generation. SMRs can be coupled to other energy sources. They can be used for cogeneration of hydrogen for transport. They can be used to generate heat and uh, power for resource extraction. Many, many possible applications that go beyond the simple energy production. The important thing is that, to recognize that nuclear energy offers a powerful, flexible solution to the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. Thank you. And we'll have an opportunity a little bit uh, later on to ask questions, not to uh, Mr. Griffith, but to one of his colleagues, uh, equally knowledgeable. We now will stay with the role of nuclear power in transport and drill deeper on its contribution to what our next speaker calls the coming hydrogen economy. Kazuhiko Kunitomi is the Deputy Director General of Fast Reactor and Advanced Reactor Research and Development at the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, and he joins us by video. My name is Kazuhiko Kunitomi in Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Today I'm going to talk about the coming hydrogen economy, the key role of nuclear energy. This slide shows research and development for HDGR and nuclear hydrogen. Many countries such as Japan, China, Poland, UK, US, Canada, Indonesia, Korea, and Kazakhstan have been developing the HDGR featured with inherent safety and providing high temperature heat for hydrogen production. Hydrogen production by HDGR is ex expected to be a promising clean energy source in 2040s. In Japan, JAEA constructed HDTR with the outlet temperature of 950 degrees C and the thermal power of 30 megawatts, and successfully completed 950 degrees C operation. In parallel, JAEA has been developing hydrogen production technologies by thermochemical water splitting called iodine sulfur process. Long-term reduction goal of greenhouse gas emission is 80% by fiscal year 2050 compared to fiscal year 2013. 
However, GHG reduction in fiscal year 2018 is just 12 percentage compared to fiscal year 2013. That means additional reduction of 68 percentage by 2050 is necessary. The pie chart at the right side shows the breakdown of greenhouse gas emission in 2018. GHG is released from power generation, transport, steel making, chemistry, and so forth. In order to achieve the reduction goal, nuclear energy shall be used for not only power generation, but also the other field such as steel making. Especially hydrogen produced by HDGR is of prime importance to reduce GHG from the fields of steel making and transport. This slide shows the status of HDTR and IS process development in Japan. As I mentioned earlier, JAEA had constructed HDTR. The reactor summer power is 30 megawatt and the outer temperature is 950 degrees C. Most of the components of HDTR are installed underground shown in the figure. After Fukushima Daiichi reactor accident, safety review by nuclear regulation authority has been conducted based on the newly established stand safety standard. NRA has confirmed that no fuel damage will occur, even in the worst accidents such as guillotine break of the primary pipe plus multiple losses of reactor shutdown functions. On June 3rd this year, JAEA got official approval of the restart of HTTR by NRA. JAEA will restart the HTTR next year. The figure at right side shows the basic process of the IS process. Hydrogen iodine decomposition process needs a heat of 400 degrees C and produce hydrogen. Sulfuric acid decomposition process needs the heat of 900 degrees C and produce oxygen. After hydrogen and oxygen are extracted from the system, iodine formed from HI decomposition process, sulfuric dioxide formed from the sulfuric acid decomposition, and water input from outside are collected into a chemical reactor. Then, the, this, then this exothermic reaction forms HI and sulfuric acid again in the reactor. So iodine and sulfur circulate in the process. That means hydrogen is produced without emitting GHG and harmful waste. IS process is an ultimate clean hydrogen production system. There are three specific HDGR system concepts. First one is an HDGR gas turbine system for power generation with the outer temperature of 850 degrees C. The efficiency of electricity generation is about 45 percentage, which is more than 10 percentage higher than that of light water reactor. It can be deployed in late 2030s. Second one is an HDGR hydrogen production system with the outlet temperature of 950 degrees C. This system can provide 85,000 cubic meter per hour of hydrogen and can be deployed in 2040s. Last one is the HDGR cogeneration system for hydrogen production, power generation, and provision of low temperature heat. Heat utilization rate of the system is about 80 percentage. It will be deployed in 2040s. Both HDGR hydrogen production system and the HDGR cogeneration system can produce a large amount of hydrogen with high efficiency. Shown here is the economical evaluation on hydrogen produced by HDGR. The capital cost of the IES system is evaluated under the condition that the number of the components used in IES system is almost double of the equivalent scale NAFSA reforming plant. The other conditions such as hydrogen production efficiency and plant availability are determined 50 percentage and 80 percentage based on several design studies by JAEA. The cost of heat from HDGR is, is evaluated by design study conducted together with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. As the pie chart shows, the hydrogen production cost is approximately 24.2 cents per cubic meter. This evaluate revealed that the most dominant factor is the cost of heat from the reactor. 
The hydrogen cost of 24.2 cent cubic meter is higher than the, lab, the target cost required by steel making industries. However, the HDGR cogeneration system can provide electricity and low temperature heat. In case uh, electricity is sold to the local community, the hydrogen cost can be reduced to 11.8 cents per cubic meters. Furthermore, in case the low temperature heat is sold to the local community, the cost can be reduced to be nearly equal to zero. Summary of my presentation, HDGR is expected to be a promising nuclear hydrogen production system in 2040s. JAEA got official approval of restart of HDTR from Nuclear Regulation Authority. Uh, the hydrogen cost of HDGR cogeneration system will be competitive by selling electricity and heat to the local district. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, he will be joining us in just uh, some minutes for our dialogue. Let's look at another industry now where nuclear power offers some significant advantages. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, climate change does present many regions of the world with the risk of chronic water shortages, straining both human health and economics. Desalination is an option for many countries, but desalination plants until now have been heavily dependent upon fossil fuels. Here too, nuclear power holds significant promise, as we hear in a presentation by Youssef Shatila. He is senior consultant to the United Arab Emirates and was the founding dean of academic programs as well as professor of nuclear and mechanical engineering at the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology. Hello. Uh, my name is Yusuf Shatila, and I will be talking today about the nuclear uh, power role in reducing emissions in seawater desalination. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what seawater desalination is, basically the definition, and how it works. And then uh, discuss if uh, seawater desalination is an emission problem, and um, my proposed solution for it, which is basically nuclear desalination, and then uh, how do I take this uh, step further uh, to use nuclear power to uh, play a, a more um, involved role in the decarbonization, decarbonization of the uh, world economy? First, uh, seawater desalination is uh, the removal of salt and minerals from seawater to acceptable levels, and these levels could be acceptable for drinking, for uh, industrial use, or, or whatever uh, the intended use for the fresh water. And then um, it is divided or categorized uh, depending on the uh, source of energy that is used, whether it is thermal in, in, in a form of heat or uh, electric through mem membrane uh, desalination. And so the most common two types is the thermal and the electrical membrane, and um, each of which is actually uh, takes half of the market for uh, uh, desalination in the world. Uh, thermal, which is heat, uh, uses consumes usually consumes uh, heat uh, in the range of uh, power of in the range of 10 to 15 kilowatt hour electric per uh, cubic meter, and the most common uh, types are multi-stage flashing, uh, multi-effect distillation, and electric uh, through reverse osmosis use uh, a little bit less amount of um, energy, uh, it is about five kilowatt electric hour per uh, metric ton, per, per uh, cubic meter. Now, I'm going to take one uh, uh, type of each to explain how it works. For the thermal, or through the heat, the multi-stage flashing goes, uh, actually happens like this. You actually feed seawater uh, into a, a boiler, which is basically um, uh, a pot that you boil the uh, or heat the um, uh, seawater in. Then you push it through stages where the pressure drops from one stage to the other. When the pressure drops, 
uh, the seawater uh, boils, uh, steam goes up, condensates, goes, and then from you do this through stages, and you collect fresh water. And then um, what is left behind is basically the uh, salt in the seawater, which remains in the um, uh, feed uh, uh, um, uh, seawater, go from stage to the other, where the uh, salt content increases, and then eventually take it out as a brine. So this is the heat. Uh, type of desalination, uh, and this is this type is actually multi-stage flashing. The other type was is electrical. It goes the same same uh, uh, same concept, but uh, I guess a different process in the removal of the salt. So you, again, you push uh, the uh, fresh water through a heat high pressure pump, uh, and this high pressure pump actually pushes the water through a membrane, like a barrier where the barrier allows the water only to go through uh, uh, and retains the salt behind. So here we have um, uh, um, the salt, here we have the fresh water. Fresh water is allowed to go through to be collected as a product, and then the salt plus the additional seawater that's coming in is taken out as brine. Um, uh, now, uh, the amount of desalination that is taking place around the world is about 100 million uh, cubic meter per day and is produced by about uh, 20,000 desal desalination plants. And these are June 2018 numbers coming from IDA. And almost all of this water is produced through the burning of fossil fuel. So it is that it, we have uh, 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 an emission problem because when you burn fossil fuel, you produce uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases. And then, so what, what is the size of the problem? This amounts to about 252 million metric tons of CO2 released per year. Now, if you replace uh, 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 the fossil fuel by another alternative uh, or renewable or clean energy like nuclear power, for example, and then you can actually uh, call it nuclear desalination, this amounts to the removal of 55 million cars off of the street. That, that's significant. Now, so nu nuclear power can help uh, decarbonization in, in the form of uh, seawater desalination. Uh, um, and uh, these are um, the world nuclear experience around the globe. In the first column, you have the name of the plant, then the second uh, location, next the, the, um, the, the power of the reactor, and then the water capacity. From the water capacity column, you see these are small capacity, these are small plants, except for the one in Kazakhstan. So in short, this slide shows us that nuclear desalination is not really popular around the globe for, for different reasons. Now, um, uh, I'm a firm believer that nuclear power in general, and in specific for this case, it can actually uh, make contribution to uh, the green uh, world economy. And here is, I guess, my uh, pitch is I want to use nuclear power to do more than just nuclear desalination. So here, uh, I created um, uh, an oasis uh, that is uh, the centerpiece of which is a small modular reactor, a uh, uh, very high temperature reactor that produces both electricity and uh, 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 and heat. Uh, part of this electricity and heat can be used on the left-hand side for the uh, nuclear for a desalination plant, um, where you use the heat for multi-stage flashing and the electricity for the reverse osmosis to uh, in a hybrid uh, setting to produce water. Uh, on the right-hand side, again, you use uh, this, uh, another part of the uh, electricity and heat of the nuclear power plant to produce hydrogen uh, to, to, that acts as the uh, fuel for the next generation um, uh, transportation fleet. So I produce hydrogen through the uh, uh, electrolysis of high uh, temperature steam. And the remaining electricity can be used to feed the grid. So, so through this, uh, I guess, concept, we created an oasis, uh, a self-sustainable oasis, uh, in which a reactor can produce electricity and heat to produce water, um, um, uh, hydrogen and then feed the grid um, uh, for the community around it. Um, some numbers, so the small modular reactor will produce 300 megawatt electric, uh, a third of which will go to the grid. Uh, um, the hydrogen production plant will be using 146 
uh, megawatt electric to produce about 280,000 to feed 280,000 light vehicles as for um, as uh, using the hydrogen as a fuel for transportation and the remaining which is about 76 megawatt electric will be used for um, a desalination plant to produce 182,000 uh, metric ton uh, um, uh, cubic meter uh, per day of fresh water through the uh, the hybrid desalination of my metal stage flashing and uh, reverse osmosis. In conclusion, I do believe that um, nuclear can play a, a, a very big role in decarbonization of our economy. And I quote uh, Bill Gates when he said, uh, nuclear is ideal for dealing with climate change because it is the only carbon-free scalable energy source that's available 24 hours a day. Thank you for your attention. attention. I will be more than happy to entertain your questions. And many thanks uh, to him as well, and we'll come back to him in just a moment. But our final presentation for today returns to that nuclear renewable partnership that many of our speakers have been talking about. Ensuring effective integration of the two is a key step toward decarbonizing industry, as we hear now from Dr. Shannon Bragg Sitton. She is the lead in integrated energy systems at the Idaho National Laboratory in the US. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to join you here at the Scientific Forum. I'm excited to share with you some perspectives on how we might achieve a clean energy economy specifically through the integration of nuclear and renewable energy sources in order to support multiple energy users. When we think about designing our future energy systems or even how we utilize our current energy systems, we need to first back up and understand the goals that we are trying to achieve. I think most of us can agree that we want those systems to be clean, non-emitting, but also to be reliable and resilient while remaining affordable and sustainable. We then need to ask, what are the energy use needs? Is it purely a need for electricity or do we also have thermal energy demand that must be met? Only then can we begin to truly assess the role that each energy source can best fill in a particular location. This brings us to the topic of integrated or hybrid energy systems in which we look collectively across the energy generation resources that we have available to better understand and characterize how we can meet the varying energy demands both efficiently and effectively. I work for Idaho National Laboratory, which is the US Nuclear Energy Lab, so I do tend to come at this from a perspective of nuclear energy utilization and try to understand how this workhorse that has provided electricity as baseload supply 24 hours a day, seven days a week in so many scenarios can be more flexible and work directly alongside renewable generation technologies such as wind, solar, and hydro, as well as fossil technologies that include carbon capture and sequestration to reliably and flexibly meet the demand on the electric grid, but also in industry in chemical plants and the production of hydrogen and supporting transportation needs as well as supporting basic needs for having clean water. Integrated energy systems offer us a key opportunity for further enhancing the flexibility of our generators. Typically we think about operational flexibility in which generators vary their power output in response to varying grid demand. Nuclear systems have been doing this for decades when needed in many different communities. Through the introduction of integrated systems, we can begin to see how nuclear technologies can be an even more flexible resource as they work alongside renewables. For example, we introduce the concept of product flexibility in which excess energy that isn't needed to support electricity demand on the grid can be diverted to the production of many diverse products such as clean water, hydrogen, support for district heating, synthetic fuels, and many more. This excess energy can also be stored for later use in thermal storage technologies, chemical storage, or electrical energy storage connected to the grid. Nuclear systems are also moving more toward deployment flexibility. Our current fleet systems are generally large scale 
on the order of a gigawatt of electricity production. Many advanced reactor developers are working on smaller scale systems, such as small modular reactors that operate at up to 300 megawatts electric, or even micro reactors that offer opportunities at the hundreds of kilowatts to a few megawatts of electricity, such that these nuclear plants can be right sized to meet the energy needs of any community, whether a large municipality or a remote community or industrial application as they work alongside distributed generation technologies. At this point, I'd like to offer a couple of examples as to what these integrated systems might truly look like. In this case, the example you see would utilize multiple generator technologies collectively to meet electrical demand on the grid, but also to support the production of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a product of significant interest because it's highly versatile. It can be stored for later use. It can also be transported to multiple end users. That hydrogen can be utilized for production of electricity to meet peak demands. It can also be transported to chemical plants and steel refining facilities as a feedstock for those processes. Hydrogen can also help us to decarbonize the transportation sector through the use of fuel cell vehicles, or that hydrogen can be combined with captured CO2 to produce syn fuels that burn more cleanly than traditional transportation fuels. These systems are now being brought to reality. We've conducted a number of dynamic analyses to look at the technical and the economic feasibility of these systems. And through collaboration with industry, we are beginning to move to demonstration projects. Within the next one to two years, we will see demonstration of production of hydrogen on site at current fleet plants in the US, uh, hosted by Exxon Corporation in the Midwest and also hosted by Energy Harbor at the Davis Bessey nuclear plant. These current fleet demonstrations will provide a strong foundation for advanced reactor demonstrations of these multi-input, multi-output energy parks. A nuclear-driven energy complex in the U.S. Midwest might look something like what you see here, in which we leverage an existing light water reactor plant working alongside renewable resources in the region to produce electricity, but also to provide clean green hydrogen to support a clean transportation fleet, to support nearby chemical and fuel synthesis facilities, as well as other nearby industrial facilities, such as refineries, fertilizer plants, and steel plants. Lest you think we're completely focused on hydrogen alone, I want to provide a second example as to how we can use these integrated generator resources to produce consumer products. In this example, you see an alternative use of carbon-based resources such as coal and biomass in processes that are driven by clean energy from nuclear technologies and by fossil energy with carbon capture, as well as renewable technologies to drive these intermediate processes necessary to produce products such as fuels, chemicals, and carbon fibers. So finally, I want to leave you with a question on how you envision meeting clean energy demands. I think it is up to us to be more creative and innovative on how we utilize all these resources collectively to achieve a cleaner, more sustainable, reliable energy future. Thank you. And that was our last presentation in this session. So we will now go to our Q&A. And we don't have Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's Jeffrey Griffin with us, but we do have his colleague, Christina van Drunen. She's Director of Science and Technology Strategy and Collaboration also at the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And we're joined as well then by our three other speakers from the session. And I'd like to first ask those of you again in the room who has a question for one of our speakers? I'm just going to first see if we have anyone who hasn't posed a question yet. And if we don't, then I'll come right back to you. Anybody else in the room have a question for one of our speakers? 
Okay, no other hands going up, then I'll go to the gentleman from Switzerland. Werner Burkhardt, Switzerland. I'm always falling on the last speaker, but you want to produce hydrogen from, it seems, an, uh, a conventional uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, we heard before from our Japanese colleague, he needs 950 degrees Celsius. At which temperature are you producing hydrogen and what's the yield, what's the efficiency of your process? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, an excellent question. It, it, okay, it, the microphones in the room make it very difficult to speak. Uh, that, that's a great point. And there are many different processes to produce hydrogen. Uh, the, my colleague in Japan spoke of the SI process or, or uh, IS process, excuse me, which does operate at these very high temperatures. Initial demonstrations at current fleet nuclear plants will utilize a low temperature electrolysis process. So water splitting using PEM electrolysis cells. And these operate uh, purely by uh, electrical integration. Uh, the production efficiency is around 22%, fairly low. Uh, but this provides us with the entry point uh, regarding hydrogen production on site at a nuclear facility. In the next stage, we are evaluating integration with high temperature electrolysis, even with light water reactors. Now, high temperature electrolysis operates at around 800 C. So we are incorporating heat augmentation techniques to boost the temperature of the thermal energy component to the necessary temperature to achieve steam electrolysis. This moves the efficiencies up to about 35%. And as I mentioned in my presentation, while these are not necessarily the end goals and the most efficient processes for hydrogen production, they provide a very good foundation. And in many markets, we find that these approaches can be competitive to steam methane reforming, which is the traditional approach. They will also provide us with that pathway toward advanced reactor demonstration of hydrogen production that gets to these higher temperature applications and higher temperature hydrogen production processes, whether that be electrolysis or thermochemical processes. Thank you very much. Do I have other questions in the room from our in-person audience? Go ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My question is for Dr. Shannon. Um, well, it is well understood that uh, nuclear can pose uh, a lot of options with cogeneration and non-power uh, uh, applications. My question is that uh, when we are talking with the renewable industry, can you elaborate the challenges while talking with the existing renewable uh, market uh, that US, for example, in your case, uh, experiences? how to integrate in such uh, capacities. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, we certainly have some different cultures when we uh, look at the integration of the renewable generation technologies and the nuclear technologies. And we've worked for several years uh, to develop those relationships and the communications with this, uh, this other generation field. And uh, we've begun to understand that each of these assets has, has pros and cons. And we are approaching this uh, very carefully to understand how we best utilize the assets of each of these generation technologies. So these initial implementations will be more of a coordinated or loosely coupled uh, configuration where we're working with new by, uh, nearby renewable generators within that same grid balancing area and understanding uh, the production of electricity and how we can support these alternative approaches. But we are also moving toward more tightly integrated facilities where we do directly connect within an energy park scenario, uh, these diverse generators, understanding that uh, we may have a hierarchy of control where electricity demand is first met by the renewable generation technologies when it's available. We may also have coupled electrical storage to manage some of that but also then utilizing the thermal resources to directly support some of these alternative applications or to go to thermal energy storage for later support to different applications. So it's about building these relationships and building a communication path such that we can truly begin to tackle the technical challenges of physical integration, 
and control systems associated with these energy parks. It's not been an easy process, but we've made a lot of progress and I, I see a lot of opportunities in the future. Thank you very much. Other questions here from our, yes, please. Hi, I'm Lizbeth from Singapore. Um, my question is to the first speaker. I understand that CNL has set a goal to demonstrate the commercial viability of SMRs by 2026. Uh, I'd like to know how the project is going and if the current situation has slowed the progress of this project. Thank you. So that would be to Christina van Drunen and welcome to you. Thank you, yes. Um, I'm happy to answer the question. Just to confirm by the current situation, you mean the pandemic? Or is there something else you're referring to? Yes, she's nodding. Thank you. So um, certainly we set the very um, ambitious objective of demonstrating the commercial viability of SMRs by 2026. It's a very important part of our uh, long-term strategy. And certainly we've made very good progress over the last several years. Um, the most exciting thing that happened in 2019 was that you may have heard that Global First Power, which is a joint consortium of um, USNC, but also Ontario Power Generation, one of the nuclear utilities that's in the province of Ontario, have a joint project that has applied with our Canadian nuclear regulator to site a reactor at our Chalk River site. And that's um, one of the, it is the first in Canada, so it's very exciting for us. And so I can confirm that while there are certainly challenges associated with how we uh, work together and collaborate as we kind of move forward, and we've had to adjust the way that we work, um, certainly that project is well underway and advancing on track. Thank you very much. Other questions here in the room, live audience. Okay, not seeing any other hands going up at the moment. Jeff, how about the online audience? Yeah, we have a few questions uh, coming in uh, over the app. Uh, there's a few on hydrogen and a few on desalination, so why don't we stay, uh, stay with hydrogen and then move to, the, to desalination? Um, I'll couple the two questions on hydrogen. The first is, what's the advantage of producing hydrogen from nuclear power plants as opposed to doing it with renewable energy sources? And then there's a specific question uh, for our panelists from Japan uh, asking about uh, the deployment of the uh, Japanese HTGR with Brayton cycle. Um, it, this, uh, this question is asking that it, last year during the IAEAGC general conference, it was mentioned that um, it could be commercially viable, um, but not before 2040. What is the actual deployment uh, time frame uh, for this technology, and what is the expected cost? Thank you very much. Then let's start with Kazuhiko Kunitomi on that last question, and maybe you also want to talk a little bit about hydrogen and comparative advantages of producing it with nuclear as opposed to uh, renewables, and then we can get other panelists take on that latter point as well. Okay. The, uh, for the HTGR gas turbine system, I think that uh, it will be deployed in 2030s. But uh, we need about uh, 10 to 15 years to complete the development of IS process. That means that uh, HTGR with IS system will be deployed in 2040s. And the, I think the advantage of the HTGR hydrogen system is that uh, the nuclear system such as uh, HTGR can produce large amount of hydrogen. So for, for example, steel making uh, industries, they need a large amount of hydrogen the nuclear energy only provide the hydrogen to those industries. I think that is the advantage of the nuclear system. Which other of our speakers would like to weigh in on that uh, hydrogen comparative advantage uh, issue? Go ahead, uh, Shannon, I see, and Christina also. So we'll take Shannon first and then Christina. 
Lee, thank you so much. And uh, absolutely, I agree with uh, Dr. Kunitomi uh, with regard to scale of production. Nuclear generation can certainly support a growing demand for uh, production of, of clean or green hydrogen. Uh, we also can go back to the efficiency uh, that I talked about uh, in answer to another question. When we look at low temperature or water electrolysis driven by electricity, uh, we're on a very low efficiency relative to what can be accomplished when we move to high temperatures that require thermal energy integration uh, that can't be as easily supported by renewable energy technologies. There is a role for renewable production of hydrogen, but there is also a significant role and a significant advantage to move to these thermally driven production methods that get to this much higher efficiency and can then drive down the cost of that hydrogen such that it is truly competitive with steam methane reforming, even when we have this historically low cost of natural gas. Thank you. And Christina? Thank you. So um, it's certainly a, a very important question. Uh, I think there's a, a couple of things that we need to keep in mind that in particular um, have been relevant parts of the conversation in Canada. One part is that um, our hydrogen economy is only as green and low carbon as the means we use to produce it, which um, Dr. Sitt um, Greg Sitton, for example, has gone through very well. The other part of it is that in a lot of the instances where we are looking, at least within Canada, but also when you're looking globally around resource extraction, you're looking in places that are, are not on the grid, that are, don't have access necessarily to um, hydroelectric power or something like that. And so in those locations where it's so remote, if you can find a small modular reactor, for example, that's deployable either because it's floating or because it is a 2.5 megawatt or something like that, then it can meet the needs of resource extra extraction, electricity, um, but also generate hydrogen that can be used for transportation in the area, for example. So it actually opens up a lot more uh, diverse options as well. Thank you very much. Jeff, shall we go to the desalination question as also? Certainly. Um, and there are, there are a few here. I'll, I'll put a couple together um, uh, and uh, start off. Um, uh, somebody's asking, uh, it's been around, nuclear desalination has been around for about 20 years with little success. Do you agree that uh, reverse osmosis is the most efficient and cost-effective uh, method for desalination and hence electricity prices are the driving factor. And I'll combine that with a question uh, that we have um, also for Mr. Shatila, uh, uh, asking about the UAE's new uh, uh, nuclear power plant at Baraka. Um, and the question is, why hasn't the UAE coupled a desalination facility with the new reactors instead of continuing to use fossil fuels and aluminum smelters? Great, thank you very much. So please, uh, Youssef Shatila. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think uh, the first one uh, is, uh, uh, I guess, reverse osmosis has been uh, proven to be the, um, I guess, the uh, horse in desalination, and I agree with that. Uh, therefore, the price of uh, water um, will be dictated by the price of electricity, and I do agree with that. Now, the question, which is probably more trick, uh, trickier, is the acceptance, well, has been in the nuclear design, has been uh, um, around for some time, but it is not popular, and I think goes back to the popularity of nuclear energy itself. Um, so it, it, once you do have a, a, a nuclear power, I guess in, in case of electricity or even heat, then you can actually tend to use it. But in 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 most of the cases, you, you do not. Um, the acceptance of nuclear desalination comes on the basis of acceptance of nuclear power. Uh, I guess the second question, um, uh, you say, why is uh, UAE is, uh, is uh, well, um, UAE considering uh, uh, nuclear desalination for the future? Uh, I think there are studies right now to include that. Uh, and I guess uh, the uh, nuclear power program in the UAE has been very uh, uh, ramping up very quickly. And uh, actually, it has been probably five to six years since the um, uh, breaking ground, and now we're about to um, uh, produce electricity with the unit number one. So this is very, very fast 
progress. And I guess the concern was um, uh, making um, uh, these uh, four nuclear power plants up and running uh, as fast as we can, as safe as we can. Uh, at the same time, make, making sure that the uh, energy requirements and uh, demands of the country is met. Of course, one of which is desalination, but I think that will become in phase two of how to uh, effectively use uh, nuclear power in more than just uh, electricity production. Uh, and by the way, I'm not speaking on behalf of the government. I do not work for the government, but, but this is basically my opinion. Thank you very much uh, for that. Let me just look to Jeff to see if we have additional questions. There, there are a couple of questions still for Mr. Shatila. If, mm -hmm. um, Great, go ahead. Uh, one is asking whether a prototype of his nuclear oasis uh, has already been constructed and how economically viable is this process? And then somewhat related, a student in the Netherlands is asking uh, whether the UAE has any um, plans or perspectives on deploying, eventually deploying SMRs, uh, and uh, if so, is there any publicly available information on that? Um, and so the prototype of the OASIS is just, uh, I guess, a study at this point. Um, is the government interested in doing in pursuing that? I do not know. As I said, I do not speak on behalf of the government. But I think it will be a, a very interesting point for an R&D uh, perspective because UOE is also ramping up its R&D activities, and one of which is uh, SMRs. Um, I, I don't remember the second question. Could you please uh, repeat the second? What was the second question? In fact, it was whether the UAE is considering uh, deploying SMRs in the future and if there's information about that publicly available. Uh, again, it's still R&D uh, space. Uh, I don't think there will be any uh, public information about uh, SMRs deployment or even the, maybe development, uh, but not really deployment. Uh, this is too early, I guess. And perhaps I'll also tack on a question uh, to you, uh, Yusuf Shatila, and then uh, take it as a bridge to some of the other panelists as well. So the question uh, to you would be this, that also countries in the region such as Saudi Arabia have been talking about the possible use of nuclear power for desalination. You mentioned uh, public acceptance or lack of acceptance on nuclear power. Could applications, other applications like desalination actually prove to become become a driver of broader interest in nuclear power in the region, also among countries that perhaps haven't been introducing it so far? In, in the region of the Middle East, I think uh, uh, if you have one solution, one energy source that solves a lot of problems, specifically seawater uh, um, uh, desalination, which is primary source of uh, uh, drinking water in, in the GCC area, that will be a huge plus and a huge win for, to, for that energy source. So if uh, nuclear power can address that, that would be uh, very important. Uh, and I guess uh, if I go back to, um, I guess, uh, Shannon's presentation and others, when we talk about uh, um, if nuclear power could actually produce um, electricity or power to, uh, in, a, in a base load fashion, and what happens if we have intermittent sources and then it goes up and down. So actually, and then the, the argument was to actually uh, um, store energy, not in the form of maybe batteries or heat, but actually in form of water or hydrogen. And in this case, where the aquifers in the GCC area uh, are emptying up because of usage. Now we can actually start refilling it by um, uh, desalinated water that was used by excessive electricity uh, where uh, nuclear renewable energy were in abundance and therefore uh, nuclear energy could actually be diverted to produce water and then store it when it is needed. I think that would be probably more effective way of using a nuclear power uh, in its uh, most efficient form, which is a base load. Thank you very much. And let me put a, a, a question uh, to Christina van uh, Drunen, which perhaps also uh, might be of interest to hear uh, Shannon's uh, a point of view on this as well. And it's this, whether getting to net zero with nuclear is rather a technological, a political, or largely a financial challenge. And depending on what you say, what do you think is the crucial next step to overcome that challenge? So um, we could actually debate this one all day. It's an excellent question. 
Um, and, and to a certain extent, it's, it truly is all of the above. So, and because they go hand in hand, you can't pull them apart. Um, certainly, as we drive technological changes, as we, you know, we drive increased improvements, there's a level of cost that comes with that that may have long-term globalized cost of energy impacts. But in the shorter term, it, it certainly could, could affect the finances. Um, and if you can master the technology and, and increase the confidence there, then certainly when you get into something like financial, you know, driving down your cost of capital can have significant, again, impacts in the longer term. At the same time, all of it truly does depend on the policy in place and whether we are truly setting up the market so that it's going to reward the behaviors that will benefit us nationally and globally in the long term so that it becomes truly sustainable. So although my background would tend to have me lean towards technical, and I believe that quite often that's where, as a nuclear industry, we tend to treat the problem. Often, I think it's actually the, the policy side and the market side and how we set that up for success that will drive all the other behaviors. And I'll pass on the same question uh, to Shannon Bragg Sitton, if you would. Well, I'm not sure I have too much to add. Christina did a great job uh, tackling that question, and, and I agree, it is an excellent question uh, that we do come upon uh, quite often. Uh, the technical challenges, I think, are something we can certainly overcome. We have a lot of good engineers and scientists working on this, and, and I think we can overcome that. In fact, we are overcoming some of the technical challenges. Uh, but, but the financial and the political aspects are significant. Uh, when we think about where we are deploying these, that will vary, that will change. We have different energy markets and, and markets treat different resources differently. And as Christina mentioned, they don't always value the behaviors that we really seek. Uh, those markets often look at the price of electricity and don't consider these thermal products and these thermal energy avenues and how they treat those generators on the grid. So we need to look at that market structure to understand, are they valuing what we value and will they lead us to the right uh, solutions on our energy portfolios in the future? With regard to financial aspects, Absolutely, we need to drive down the costs of some of these new technologies. We can look to many different reports that show least cost portfolios for deep decarbonization, uh, including nuclear, and the value of, and the percentage of nuclear in those scenarios increases as the cost of nuclear decreases. So as we introduce new technologies, we do need to keep an eye to the cost associated and as we drive down those costs, we will see that the challenges associated will be much smaller and easier to overcome to achieve that energy future we're all looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just go back to Jeff one more time because I hear you typing away. Is that because you have more questions coming in or is it? No, it's just because our, our speakers are so fascinating and I'm taking notes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope our speakers heard that. They, he's uh, avidly following the discussion. Then before I uh, ask for a warm round of applause, let me just say that uh, this has been a very, very good bridge to uh, some of the first things we're going to talk about tomorrow, which is what kind of models allow us to do this sort of systemic evaluation of costs and benefits of nuclear and other sources in an increasingly complex energy mix? So a very, very good bridge to take us uh, from this first day of the scientific forum into the second day. Let us now please give our speakers in this second session a very warm round of applause. And ladies and gentlemen, that does bring day one to a close, but there's much to look forward to. So please join us either live here in the room. And thank you to all of you for being with us through this long and very intensive day today, or also on our live stream, of course. We will be very eager to have you with us once again on day two, starting at 9.30 in the morning, Vienna time for session three on a topic of enormous importance for boosting nuclear 
nuclear's role and public acceptance of it, namely innovations in managing the nuclear life cycle, all across the life cycle of nuclear power. So many thanks to all. Please enjoy your evening, and we look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow. And thanks also to my co-moderator, Jeff, for the great support.